Welcome. Uh, this is the after party talk. Uh, Lev Weidman of Tel Aviv University gave a talk, The Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics and the Born Rule. And uh, we have our Math for Wisdom friends, Francis Howard, Thomas Gaidosik, John Harland. Francis is in Ghana, I think, Thomas in Lithuania, John in California. And uh, so we're going to have fun. Um, we'll share our impressions. Uh, Welcome to Math for Wisdom. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. Who's going to go first? I, I want to ask John to go first because uh, you were the one who wanted us to have this uh, uh, experience. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it, it certainly the foundations of quantum mechanics are, are, are great at interest to me, and I spent a lot of time thinking about them. You know, the many worlds interpretations, I've probably spent the least time uh, entertaining it. And so it was really nice, you know, spending a full hour listening to it and understanding, uh, you know, being being in the presence of someone who's a strong advocate of it. I don't know if I got much more out of the talk than I already knew. Um, I, I think... You know, like I, I did mention it, you know, in my question, a couple objections that I've heard, and they are actually my objections too. That it, 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 it's, it's very, you know, it very much violates Occam's razor in my mind, um, and it also, you know, replaces one obscurity with the other. It, it. On the other hand, you know, from a mathematical point of view, having a, a purely unitary theory is very attractive. You know, I like I like the mathematics of it. I think it's, you know, makes it. But in my heart of hearts, I think that it's worth thinking about foundational quantum mechanics in a different way because I think that there can be very measurable consequences of other ways of thinking about quantum mechanics, and and we might be missing something. For example, relativistic causality. You know, very, very you know, I, I'm very sacrosanct idea in physics um i think it's i think it's uh i think it's worth it for some of us to challenge that uh to challenge locality and rel relative causality i think we might you know it very well be wrong but i think that it's good that a certain number of people challenge that because it is an orthodox um position and i think that if it is ever violated that this could this could lead to to another uh, this could relativistic lead to other, causality being violated yeah this could this could lead to other phenomena that that are not what that are not understood now this could lead to to other measurements and and uh, other other phenomena that that are open up a new a new line of thinking in physics so this is where i like to live you know i'm this is kind of where i spend a lot of my time um and of course i don't for one for one moment think that that um any challenge to orthodoxy is valid uh i don't i think that in the end with physics that if you're going to make a new theory that and it and it challenges the orthodox and it challenges the orthodoxy that there should be experiments that 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 you suggest that that either can confirm that theory or or reject it. Like I think that really it, it has to be empirical in the end if we're talking about physics. Now if we're just talking about mathematics, you know, that's that's not the case. But you know, I'm I'm interested in physics. So um I guess this is one of my uh, another critique I have of any of these foundational ideas in, in quantum mechanics is that, you know, unless there's measurements, unless there's actual experimental uh, framework for, for, uh, for gra gravitating toward one, one theoretical foundation and the other, then I think that it's all very provisional. It's all, it's all interesting, but very provisional. So many worlds seems very provisional to me. Spontaneous collapse seems provisional to me, um, and uh, and this and the standard interpretation of the collapse of the wave function is also to me very obscure and very provisional. I I don't I don't believe in any of them. 
uh, and uh, and so I'd like to I'd like to probe ideas that maybe uh, lead toward maybe another uh, foundation of the subject that may have experimental consequences that we can you know that's kind of where 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 my thinking is. So, Francis, yeah. what that's it. You saying? so th and I'm glad we were well represented in the talk. We were like one sixth of all the participants. I know. We we're like I know. probably about a half of all the questions. So Francis has the question. Re Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose himself. Uh, we were next to Roger Penner. <laughs> that was really cool. A high, a that kind of got you. That kind of got me excited. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, so I was excited. Uh, so Francis, uh, you were calm and collected. Um, what did you? What were your impressions? Um, let me tell us what what he presented. I, I I kind of I noticed that he made a. Uh, mentioned that he is not particularly interested in the in the algebra or the mathematics behind but he wants to see things as uh, they are so i think he he has been using a lot of uh, reality but i believe that apart from the fact that physics is a bit physical it needs much more intuition and uh, experiments to perform some of the physical uh, uh, happenings or things that we might see. In the case of he mentioning that um, taking different observers at different points and looking at the same thing, they would have to measure their probability in different ways. It is true because probability um, statistics is not an exact science. It's just the way that we use to uh, measure things, the likelihood of an event, which is very probable. But I had much more of a, a concern with when he raised the issue of the tiger and the clouds, because we, we all know very well that if a cloud is to form an object, the shape of a lion or a tiger, the clouds is just a collection of um, um, raindrops, drops of dews, that are, are humidity, that forms much of a, a shape that we could Imagine that this shape is like an object we have seen before. That is, if it's a tiger, the shape of a tiger. But um, obviously, we we are aware that it's not a tiger. It, it is just the shape that looks like the tiger. So I think his, his approach to interpreting the bond rule was much more of a, a physical concern and an imaginative approach than um, using exact tools of physics and mathematics rigorous. That is what I want to see. Thomas? Okay, I, I guess I will try to shortly summarize what I liked and what I didn't like. And in order to be positive afterwards, I will first say what I didn't like. And this, I think this was Francis already said that he doesn't like and embrace the algebraic part that one has to calculate and get something out. I mean, if you don't, then why do you do physics? What I didn't like is saying that something that is confusing, like really what John said, this many, many worlds. So what does it tell me is more appealing to him, but that's his opinion. And I like that he said it's his opinion. What I additionally liked is that he is considering to some extent that my interpretation of the world depends on me that he in that sense distinguishes and takes the person gives it a value enough and says okay i look when if it's me looking at ex an experiment i see it but the most important part is that whatever physics i have should explain also if possible my experience I think I really like this approach and I like his approach to teleportation that, well, teleportation is in that sense not some magic and not something that happens instantaneous. 
but something where information travels and then can be manifested by having a state. And I would agree that saying, if I take the wave function, it describes now, if the wave function describes me, then it has to describe me in all my complexity. And if I can teleport this wave function, he doesn't need to transport my electrons in order to bring me mm -hmm. somewhere else. I would agree to that because my experience is also I exchange material with the surrounding, but I stay me. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, this emphasis on an entity, on a, in that sense, person or somebody who is teleported, that it's more than only the sum of atoms is, I think, also something that I liked in his viewpoint, and that I would say, yes, we I should keep. Uh, th that was something in the talk that uh, I felt I understood that, like, it was something new, you know, that I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the bomb, the bomb thing that he's famous for, I couldn't understand what he was thinking. I have to have to read about that later. I wish maybe I had read about it before. But as regards to teleportation, I think the thing that was left unsaid, I suppose, is how do you register that wave function? So you have to have a mechanism, I guess, that can take Thomas Gaidosik and register exactly like what he is. So that's an impressive machine, you know, and you have to have two of them and they have to be separated. Is that correct? And they have to be separated by a billion miles. So uh, is that, do I, did I understand that correctly? I, I'm not sure. I would say that who registers what is me is me myself. I'm as well, a person but, can but, identify but, myself that it's me. No, but your information has to be recorded. I think that's the point. Like, you can tell the teleportation part's the easy part. You just need to have, you know, those uh, spin up, yes. spin down particles or whatever. How, how, but the hard part is how, how, how do get... you register the wave function so that uh, all the spins will be flipped? Because you have to have the bazillion spins recorded. Yes. Right? Yeah, and then you have I to mean, have the bazillion spins. He, he didn't answer that. And I think okay, there so... is no technological answer to it and even conceptual. Okay, so I just wanted to, I understood that part, I guess. Too. <laughs> so, but also, I mean, I mean, what that says, it says that kind of things that John talks about, uh, our, our lovely John Harlan, that um, it, then it becomes all about the machine. You know, what kind of machines exist out there? Like, do there exist these machines that, you know, like that allow us to do a quantum experiment or that allow us to do a teleportation or like, you know, what is it involved in, a, in the quantum machine? Which he kind of, I think he was against this type of thinking about the machine. He said, "You shouldn't be thinking about the machine." If I understood correctly, but yeah, but this is what I didn't get either. It's like I was not key on that. Or yeah, I, didn't... I mean, if you're going to talk about physics, you better talk about machines because I mean, <laughs> that's how we that's how we do physics. I mean, we we don't do physics in our minds. I mean, we do certainly do uh, mm -hmm. part part of uh, you know we do part of physics in our minds. But you know, the the beautiful thing about about science and physics is that it is subject to empirical verification. I think it's one of the, you know, the thing that, that distinguishes physics and science from other, uh, other the other intellectual pursuits. It, it really is subject to the scientific method. And is, I think it's very important, you know, so we have to think about how we're actually going to realize these ideas in the, in the laboratory. I think that that is, I mean, I'm, I'm very much, I'm very much uh, attached to that. I don't, I don't think we're doing, we're not completing, we're not completing the, the loop unless we do that. So, but I think we can do it like Einstein and make a thought experiment without actually writing and writing a proposal for building the machine. Oh, yes. If yes. We, but, I mean, but, the uh, conceptual but, part, I think is enough for us. To do it but this is oh, what yeah, really no, I'm, not, I'm not against yeah. i'm not against theoretical physics i'm i'm just saying that it's very important that epr actually resulted in an experiment in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s that actually actually performed that experiment and verified the the validity of quantum mechanics it was very important that that was that you know those are those, those to me are seminal experiments and mm -hmm. without those uh, epr and bells and inequalities and stuff are just are not as, as interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a great interest to me now that they've been verified in the laboratory. You know, to me, I can, they're about as close to truth as anything that I can think of. 
whereas before they were theoretical ideas that were very interesting um, and, and were screaming for verification. Um, and um, so, so, you know, I think fundamentally we don't know, you know, I, I, have I made this analogy before? I, you know, maybe, uh, Francis, I, you, you've never heard me speak of this before, but, but Andrews and, and Thomas may, may have heard me say this before that, you know, there's, there's been obscurities in mathematics and science throughout history. And one example is, for example, uh, the invention of calculus. I think a lot of mathematicians did not accept calculus because it was not on equal footing with Euclidean geometry. They thought of it as interesting and maybe useful for doing computations, much much the way we think of quantum field theory now. But it it was not on a firm foundation until the theory of limits was discovered. Once the theory of limits was was adopted and discovered, and then the con um, then then the subsequent um, uh, theory of sets, you know, Cantor's theory of sets. Then calculus was on a foundation that was was comparable to Euclidean geometry. I, I'd say that analysis and geometry on comparable. Uh, some would argue with me that one is a little more solid than the other still, but I would say that they're on for for all practical purposes. Calculus is no longer obscure. I think that physics is undergoing a similar, a similar transition now. It, it, you know, with with the uh, everything, everything was seen to be tied up nicely with Einstein's local theory of gravity. It seems like locality and relativistic, um, rel relativistic causality was was a very firm foundation until you know a few years later, and then we, then we had to deal with quantum mechanics, and I think it's still very obscure. I think it's still. Uh, we haven't figured out foundations that are as satisfying as the other foundations in physics and all uh, you know foundations of, of of calculus. I would say that mathematics went through uh, a transition from obscurity to its present state somewhere about 150 years ago, and I have high hopes for physics. And. Yes. and I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, I don't know when it's going to happen. It might happen tomorrow. It might happen a thousand years from now. I don't know. Uh, but I think the adventure is is uh, exciting. You know, it's it makes physics more interesting than math in a certain sense hmm. because a novel idea in physics can have much more leverage than a novel idea in mathematics. Mm -hmm. and you, do something to clear up some of this obscurity. No, it, can, it can affect all of physics or, you know, a big chunk of physics. Right? And it doesn't need to be, and it doesn't need to be, uh, it doesn't need to be a, a particularly complicated idea. And and I think, I mean, John is uh, that type of person, but I think that Francis is also that type of person who is looking for, you know, the big win. <laughs> I don't know. Are you have ambitions? Is that correct? Yes, yes. Exactly. I, yeah, I think there's ambitions. There's something... Yeah, Francis, please. Um, I, I, when I look at look at the universe and how, um, looking at the experience of Gelman and when he was in Princeton at the same time with Einstein, he never made any substantive uh, meeting or went for any um, talk or discussion with Einstein. And after Einstein died, he was interviewed. Gelman was interviewed, and the, the, the host asked him. Okay, why did you not uh, ever go to any of the meetings of Einstein or you never made any attempts to meet um, Einstein? Then he said he noticed Einstein was not very much interested in quantum mechanics and uh, he believed that everything could be derived from the theory of gravity. For some time, I've been thinking about this for about some few, uh, some few years now. And I, I, I'm trying to see a way through that, um, through what we call the deformations. For my field in quantum mechanics or quantum physics, I'm very much uh, rigorous in quantum calculus with how we deform a particle and how a shape is being deformed and its spinner is being deformed. I look at the boson and fermions and the deformity, looking at the P and Q parameters. Uh, previously, 
most physicists are much aware, like uh, and Ben Hardin and uh, most of them, they are much aware with the Q deformity when it comes to the Q orthogonal polynomials and the Q combinatorics, they are much rigorous with that. And much recent times, mathematicians have developed a lot of PQ deformities for quantum, um, for combinatorics and octagonal polynomials. After, careful look, after carefully looking at these um, tools and working rigorously with um, the combinatorics and the PQ, I, I noticed that there is a way that the Einstein gravitational wave could be deformed. And if this deformity obeys the rules of curvature and obeys the Bose, con um, condensate, Bose condensation as well as the um, Fermi uh, particles rules, then there is a way that it could develop every particle of matter. So I'm, I'm still looking at that direction, which seems to be a hard mathematics with a lot of physical um, observation. But I'm thinking there should be a progress through that end. But I believe particles obey strict mathematical structures without any compromise. Now, that is what I believe. God, if God yeah. would have been anything, I think God would have been a mathematician. Hmm. You know, and, that sounds like if, big if, stuff. If, if I understood correctly, uh, that the basis is the gravitational wave and it gets deformed into all the possible particles. Is that the Absolutely. summary of it? Absolutely. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Okay, so that's, that's a, ambitious. That's, 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 that's very good. good. That's yeah, you can join the club. <laughs> I, maybe I'll ask. Um, I mean, I'm glad. First of all, I'm, I'm really glad that we had this kind of outing. You know, it's our second one, and I think that uh, there's something to be said about uh, having a shared talk. You know, so if we have more talks like this, that we think, uh, I think that's great. It's nice to talk about them afterwards. Um, but this was kind of curious for me. I mean, the fact that Roger Penrose was there in the room, you know, made me, you know, now we don't really know, we didn't see him, but still, you know, <laughs> maybe that was right, just a that's fake, that's you know, fake that's Roger that's Penrose. Yeah. But, but I think, you know, and I think he was not the only dignitary in the room, you know, I don't just recognize the other ones. <laughs> but I think, was also there. Some, some other few, um, Drake Divine was also there. Mm -hmm. some, some other few dignitaries, very good physicists to him. And, and I think I looked at, you know, I was interested that uh, according to Wikipedia, you know, this uh, speaker, uh, Lev Weidman, was a, you know, a person of um, stature. Um, but yes. I was not impressed by the talk in a certain sense, uh, partly because I thought the exposition was lacking in certain key places, that it could have been like, you know, even his own bomb device. I think a few words would have made it much more understandable, probably. Yeah. And then, um, but just in terms of like his argumentational <laughs> toolkit seemed kind of weak. So, but I think on the other hand, I think like it may be very rare, like this type of, uh, this niche that he occupies, it's maybe very special and rare, you know, it's like the type of niche that Einstein occupied, or, you know, like the famous uh, thought experiments, etc. Like, how many people focus on things like that, and maybe not very many, and maybe it's a special crowd. So, um, so maybe Thomas, I don't know if you can say, like, how common is a talk like this? It's the first time I heard something like that, so... On conferences, well, I don't see it because I don't go to conferences like that. And usually mm -hmm. if the conference is about subjects, they are, well, they don't include it. If it's a philosophical conference, it could be there, but... Yeah, like like a philosophical conference typically is a more academic philosophical discussion. And usually, and like yes. a physics, you know, the talks, I've been to the National Conference for Lithuanian Physics, you know, it's about experiments or some kind of calculation or something like that. So this is like one yeah. percent of the talks are going to have this type of, um, I think. I mean, but but I would the say these the are the interest, interesting talks in a coffee room when people start to share their own opinion yeah. and discuss what they, is really important to them. So in that sense, it's I think really good. But it, uh, yeah, I agree to you that the preparation was not. Could have been better thought through, 
on the other hand, all the slides preparing is already quite some work too. So. Well, they were they were prepared. I just but like um yes. So one of the things that's so it's a very special company, and so that Math for Wisdom was able to click with this world. You know, it's very fascinating for me. You know that oh, like we okay. we you know we connected with this world in a, in a nice way. We have of course team with different uh, superheroes, um, different capabilities, but also like you get to see like. Uh, his he was honest and it was like his naked thinking. So like the arguments he used in the beginning, saying like, "Well, I'm going to talk about good exposition, right? Like, good exposition. I mean, or I think good argue, good explanation was the thing. So for example, local yeah. distance is a good ox, you know, local action is a good explanation. Deterministic is a good exposition, right? And it's like, well, shoot. Well, then I can say present. I mean, past, present, future is a good explanation, but an even better explanation is that there's two pasts and two futures and there's two causalities and that's a better one. And I'm going to use that as my starting point, you know. So yeah. um, uh, that was just kind of curious. And you can see, I mean, I was very, um, I was just running up there. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah, I mean, were. I got away with uh, saying what I wanted to say, and I think I was understood, and maybe I said 10 things, and maybe people understood two of them, but I thought like, well, and I was able to have that personal experience to say, well, can I do that? I, I lived and survived, I think, so I was, uh, you, saw, <laughs> you saw me there, yes. so I was happy. It, it just felt like, oh, I could live in that world, maybe next time be a little bit more calm, you know, but uh, to think like, oh, I'm not uh, crazy, you know, or, or well, I'm just crazy, you know, anyways, I have something to work on and share and think crazy is everybody else so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... i was really surprised all i did was go to the patreon web page fill in a few blanks uh it was basically all automated and there i was i was a donor and it, i mean two euros a month that's that's really nothing uh i'm getting a lot out of math for wisdom and i think you will too or like I thought, like if he can get away with this, well, I have a lot better theory. Than that. yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what I felt. It, 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 it is. It, it, yeah. I mean, many worlds does have a, uh, an element to it that is well. It it lacks it on the surface. It lacks you know some plausibility. That's for sure. And so it is a leap of faith. I mean, like to say that there really are all these. I mean, it, it's just it's just. It, it, it is kind of a crazy way of thinking about things, but you know, crazy ideas have have been useful in the in the past. So, but you're right; it's no it's no less crazy than what you think. Uh, I, well, I, I maybe do the advantage that. is like mine is crazier, which is a, in the good sense. Like, I think like the many worlds theorem is kind of like a, a cheap solution. It's basically saying, well, given that we don't know and can't know, let's pretend it's impossible to know, right? So then that's the simplest explanation, right? So, whereas I'm saying, I'm gonna start from scratch. I'm going to make some, I'm not gonna take your good expositions. I got my own good exposition that I'm entering in. I've got this five-fold framework. I'm going to read, uh, I was glad I was able to make that point. Like I'm gonna read the algebra and I'm gonna come up with my own theory. And it's gonna be crazy, but at least my theory being crazy will be uh, saying something new and saying something testable and saying something contributing, you know, because it, yeah. ever, it didn't seem like the many worlds theorem is contributing at least. To, oh, here's Harris. Uh, thank you. Hi, now Harris. we're fivefold. Good. Hello. But I have to admit that I didn't see something testable from your predictions, Andrews, yet. So not yet, but uh... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> not yet. I'm waiting. OK, I'm patient. Yes. So Harris, right, we're just uh, so four of us ask questions. Only Thomas didn't. What was the question you would have? Thomas knows everything. He doesn't have to ask a question. No, <laughs> no, no. I don't know anything. But I'm. I was not sure what I should really formulate as a question, mm -hmm. which would help me to understand things better. Because just telling, well, I don't find that plausible is not a question. <laughs> it's, yes. yeah, it's a comment <laughs> well excuse me you know I, I think in my question i i i tried to point out what i see is valuable in many worlds and that you get a you get a nice mathematical yes uh theory you know it's all this unitary evolution which is mathematically very nice you know and then and then you also um can maintain relativistic causality locality basically and and that's also nice 
it's just that it's, those, those two things may be false. I mean, it's, yes. it occurs to me that physics may, you know, dynamical systems may only be part of physics. Um, it could be that not all physics, not all phenomena can be described dynamically. That's one, you know, I mean, that flies in the face of orthodoxy, but that may be one thing. And the other thing is that who says relativistic causality also is the law of the land. I mean, so uh, these are things that I think are, I think, uh, you know, like the Bell's, Bell's uh, uh, analysis, you know, kind of, kind of does question, you know, I think, Relative, relative to causality, and it, and um, I think it's worth questioning. It's worth, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't want to just assume that all that is true. You know, now where do you go from there? I don't know. You know, I, I play around with things where, um, you know, foundationally, quantum mechanics is more than just a dynamical system. What is beyond a dynamical system? Very hard very hard to think of what could be being a dynamical system uh and then it, if relativistic causality is violated it's got to be violated in a particular kind of way right it's got to be very specific because we don't we don't <laughs> we don't see obvious violations of it and so these are kind of my 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 favorite things to think about um i want to jump in and say uh i was very encouraged i think I'm glad we're all here. It's a huge crowd. Uh, I'm very encouraged uh, that um, we heard this talk because I know John, you know, and uh, and I just think that it really makes me appreciate uh, John's uh, work and his uh, thought and such. And say, you know, I I have hopes that uh, for John that his you know that you could develop a theory that would really raise the bar, you know, so. I just want to say like to see like the kind of like the level you know in the room and i just wanted to say i think that's a great sign of encouragement we just have a few minutes i think we'll end uh with this zoom session just because uh, maybe i'm walked out i think we had a, you know we had when we had a long talk i want to uh, francis at the final minute uh, to end with a prayer uh so think of a physics prayer or any kind of prayer you like to conclude um but harris um what do your what were your impressions of the you know what did you think well, um, it was interesting, and as I said, I understood more of it. I was more at home uh, with it. Um, yeah, I did feel I don't like this, and I don't know if he's worked with James Bedman, but I was faced uh, at Bristol with this, you know, there's only waveform functions, there's no things, um, things like that. I was faced a bit with this at Bristol. One thing that I wanted, but we obviously don't have time for it, was to see this in a historical context and see that these were problems that were topical at some point in the 20th century. Um, and then same as like physics is becoming more, how can I call it, obtu obtuse? What is that word? Like, you know, weird. Obtuse. Like with string theories and th string theory like you know and, and that these are becoming a more niche interest and other questions are coming to the forefront and if you i think if you adopt um a longer term view of the whole of science you might detect different ways different things being at the forefront for example even like for example I, i've been interested a lot um, I went recently, I was in Turin, and Egyptology was, in the 1820s, was at the forefront, like all the topical questions were in Egyptology, mm -hmm. basically, like archaeology. And you also had scientific forestry at some point. You also, like, I would say now the thing is big data. Mm -hmm. And I would like to develop, you know, that information even after the, when these guys were working like the many worlds interpretation was a bit later it was in the 70s i think you have read wrote in the 70s but there were traces already of the of the of information entering physics from the 47 i think what was it that cybernetics guy 
Mm -hmm. And then look at where information has gone now, like, you know, Hawking and these things. So physics moved towards information. And then these, um, these questions or some questions lose their cutting edge and their urgency, maybe. You know, the okay. bigger mass, I don't know, Thomas might tell us. So we have... The bigger mass goes towards other questions, like, you know... Mm -hmm. uh, so we have, so we're going um, to another... We're going to end now in 30 seconds. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Uh, thank you to our viewers. And so, Francis, lead us out. Uh, conclude. I have it in front. We thank you for a fruitful section. We, as we're about to depart, we pray that you would help us in our imaginations. And we know that you are infinite and you have all the ability to be transcendence. We ask that you help our minds that have limits to be infinite, to be able to imagine well. This we ask. Amen. Amen. Amen.